Let's read God's Word this afternoon in Exodus 18. The text that we consider is verses 13 to 26, which I obviously will not reread, but I do ask you to pay special attention to verses 13 to 26. Let's read the whole chapter, Exodus 18. Hear the word of God. When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel as people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. And her two sons, of which the name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for the God of my father, said he, was mine help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness, where he encamped at the mount of God. He said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law, Jethro, am come unto thee, and thy wife, and her two sons with her. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and did obeisance, and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of Pharaoh who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came and all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And now begin the words of our text. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? And Moses said unto his father-in-law, because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. 
And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And they judged the people at all seasons, the hard causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. And Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way into his own land. Thus far we read God's word. Just before we begin, if you keep on having your Bible open, you can put a finger in Deuteronomy chapter 1, because there is some expansion of ideas in our text given in Deuteronomy chapter 1, starting at verse 9. And so I'll bring that up a couple times in the course of the sermon. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, this Word of God before us tonight has to do with one man trying to do the work in Israel alone. Trying to care for the people, bear their burdens, judge their cases, but he's trying to do it alone. And then someone else comes sees what's going on, identifies the problem, you're doing this alone, you can't do this, it's too difficult, it's too heavy for one man, and so I'm going to give you advice, you need other people to come alongside you and to help you, and so to speak, distribute the load. So that's really the main idea of these verses before us. I want to make very clear at the beginning this afternoon I am not preaching this text because I believe we have such a situation here in Heritage. It's actually the opposite of that, and I thank God for it. And I think it's good for you to hear, congregation, from the pulpit something about the office bearers with whom I serve that I am very thankful for them and that they are men who bear the burden with me, and definitely who assist me and are faithful, hard workers in the office. I'm so grateful for them. And I want to make clear that I'm not preaching this tonight because I believe that there's any one man, including myself, who's doing the work and no one else is helping. That's not at all the case. I am preaching this text because, for one thing, It's always good to have encouragement in our callings in this Christian life. Even a calling by God's grace that we are performing faithfully as office bearers, it's always good to have encouragement to continue along the way we're already going and even to progress in that. But I'm also preaching this particular text at installation because obviously it has to do with office bearers. You'll pick that up as you read the verses. Rulers in the church. And what we have here is an Old Testament passage that we might not think about, but it gives good instruction for why we do what we do in the church of Jesus Christ today. Have you ever wondered why it is that we have not one man or even just two men, but we have a body of rulers in the church? Have you ever wondered why it is that deacons have their specific tasks and the ruling elders theirs, but then you have a pastor who preaches and teaches and why you have the distribution of the load in that way? Such questions we'll give answers to, but it arises from a text like this. Why reform church government? We have opportunity to receive instruction tonight on that here. There's a man in this chapter by the name of Jethro. When I say the name Moses, everyone recognizes that, of course. We might not be as familiar with this man named Jethro. You picked up on the fact that he is Moses' father-in-law. It was Jethro's daughter, Zipporah, 
who was married to Moses. So that makes Moses Jethro's son-in-law. Moses and Zipporah had a couple of children that were told of on the pages of Scripture here. And just to give you a little glimpse into the history, at first, when Moses and Israel left the land of Egypt, Moses intended to bring his wife and his two children with him. But for whatever reason, at some point early on, he actually sent them back home to be with dad and grandpa, Jethro. And now, what Jethro's doing, and maybe this was an agreement between Moses and Jethro, we don't know, but now what Jethro is doing is he is bringing his two grandchildren and his daughter back to Moses. And they're reunited here at the beginning of the chapter. And so Jethro uses this opportunity also to visit a little bit, not only with his son-in-law, but also with the rulers and people in Israel. And now as he visits Moses, he picks up on a problem and he addresses it with a solution. And that's what our text is about. There's no doubt, by the way, that Jethro is a child of God. You pick up on that before our text, and that comes out in the text. I won't even have to show you that. It'll be apparent. He's in the generations of Abraham, comes as a descendant of Abraham, and is a God-fearing priest. So let's consider this history and apply it under the theme Jethro's counsel to Moses. Jethro's counsel to Moses. Let's see that it's needed, and there we'll see that what the problem is and that Jethro gets to the heart of it. And then secondly, that it's given, this counsel is, and then third, that it is followed by Moses. Let's get before us some of the events that lead up to Jethro's giving advice to Moses. We read of something that Moses is involved in right at the beginning of the text, verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning unto the evening. Now we're not going to get into what he's actually doing, we'll get into that in a second. But I want you to imagine for a moment a long line of people. And I would imagine it's so long that it's wrapping around. And here's Moses. And the people are coming toward him, this line. They've got their cases, their problems. And he has to declare judgment on it. He has to render a, a, a verdict. He's doing this all by himself morning to evening. This is a full-time job. This is more than a full-time job. The line, you might say, is out the door. Now Jethro, father-in-law, is observing on this particular day. He's watching as all of this is happening. And he comes up to Moses and he says this, Verse 14, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? Moses, what are you doing? And why are you doing this all alone? And so, you can hear already in that question. Sometimes people can ask a question and they're already indicating something by the way they ask it. You can hear that in what Jethro says. This is not just seeking information. Can you tell me, Moses, more about what you're doing? This is expressing some concern and even some disapproval about the fact that Moses is doing this all by himself. So, Moses gives an answer to his father-in-law starting at verse 15. Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses brings out the fact that he's a leader of the people, 
and he's a representative of God in their midst. And so the people would come to Moses and they would have inquiries. They would consult him on different things and they would seek his judgment on particular cases. They might come on legal matters. We've got this legal issue between us and so we want you, Moses, to resolve this. But there were other things, and this is where Deuteronomy 1 comes in. The people, it says, had problems and burdens and complaints or disputes. Small things, big things, everything in between, they brought to Moses. And what Moses then would do when the people came up to him in this line is he would judge And that simply means he would decide the case. And he would, in the process of that, teach them. We'll come back to that. But he would make them know, or he would teach them, God's statutes, that's simply the things that God prescribes for his people, and he would make them to know or teach them the law of God. Whatever God has revealed to his people, his will for their life, Moses taught these things to the people who came up to him in the line. So imagine it like this. You've got two people, they're married, and there's a problem between them, and so they come in the line, and finally they get up to where Moses is, they explain the case to him, and Moses not only decides the case between the husband and wife, but in the process of doing that, he takes God's law and he applies it to this specific situation of their marriage, and he resolves the case. Closed, the people can leave and go home. And of course, the proper judgment of some dispute or burden or problem that people had, the the resolution would then send the people back to their tent in peace. That is, their case is resolved, and they can be at rest in that sense. Did you notice in, in Moses' answer to his father-in-law, though, father-in-law was already expressing concern, but Moses in his answer doesn't really seem to share that concern that he's doing this all by himself. He just tells his father-in-law what he's doing. He supplies some information. I want to apply this already to the church today. It can be, in the church of Jesus Christ nowadays, that a man, and maybe we think especially of a minister, but it doesn't have to be, could be an office bearer, he wants to do the work all by himself. And maybe even the other men in the office are willing to assist him, but he wants to do the work himself. Now, I don't think Moses was motivated by pride here. But it might be that an office bearer today when he says, I want the people to come to me alone with their problems and I want to do all the work of the church only, he might be very well motivated by pride. There's something that strokes the ego a little bit. Everyone comes to me with their issues and I'll do it all. But it might just be that a man does the work by himself like Moses simply because he sees it and Well, it's there, and yes, there's lots of it, but why wouldn't I do it? And so a man just does the work. So it happens in the church today. And so, Moses is doing this thing. Jethro says, what are you doing, and why are you doing it alone? Moses explains, and now Jethro responds to his son-in-law. And he's really just being very blunt, and he gets right down to the heart of the matter. He says in verse 17, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Jethro's blunt, isn't he? And sometimes we just need to be like that. Just say it the way it is, and Jethro does. 
this thing that you're doing, Moses, seeing these people coming in line from morning to evening and handling all these cases is not good. And then he goes on to explain why he says that. And the central concern that father-in-law Jethro has, and this is what the sermon is all about, his central concern is the work of judging the people is too heavy for one man alone. It's too difficult just for you, Moses, and you're able, not able, to do it all by yourself. That's the heart of the concern that his father-in-law has. And Moses, if you keep on going on this way, and you try to do this all by yourself, hearing all these cases day by day, you're going to wear out. You're going to wear away. You're going to drop down with exhaustion, and you're not going to be able to do it anymore. And what's interesting, not only are you going to wear away, but Jethro says the people are too. You might say, well, what's the connection there? Well, it's this. If Moses gets exhausted and he drops down, maybe even literally, and he can't do it anymore, then who's going to decide the people's cases? And who's going to settle all the disputes? And the people are going to be going days, even weeks, maybe months, with all their problems unresolved, and they're going to drop with exhaustion too. It's not good for you, Moses, if you're doing this alone, and it's not good for the people of God either. Already here, Christ shines out of the text in a beautiful way. Moses, as you might know, is a type of Jesus Christ. That means he points ahead to Christ. Now when you have a type in the Old Testament, there is a certain respect in which the type always fails. And that helps us not pay attention so much to the type anymore, and it exalts the one to whom the type points. So you always have to pay attention, where does the type fail? Well, Moses fails as a type of Jesus Christ in one of the places here. Because he wants to do the work of the people of God. He wants to bear their burdens and care for it and do it himself. He has the work before him. But he can't. He's going to wear away. But we have one, a greater than Moses, who will never, ever wear out. Never drops with exhaustion and becomes too tired with all the matters of the church that he addresses. Moses can't, but Christ can. And he does, and he's more than able to not only bear the load of our iniquities and all the way to the tree and to bear those away, but now that he's ascended into heaven, our judge, our high priest, our ruler, with compassion to take care of his church by his word and spirit. He's able. And I want to apply also this part of the text to us. And what I'm going to say could very well apply to husbands and wives or to fathers and mothers or to someone who is involved in some kingdom cause. But I'm going to apply it to office bearers. But you may think along those other lines as well. When there is an office bearer in the church who tries to fly solo for whatever reason. He has to hear it today just as bluntly as Jethro brought it then. The thing that you're doing, office bearer, trying to do it yourself, is not good. You can't do it alone. It's too much for one man. And also the word today, and this becomes very rich, if you're trying to do it alone and you try to keep on going that way, you're going to wear out. And we know sometimes that happens to office bearers. 
they just drop. But the congregation is going to suffer too because especially if it's a minister, he's not able to go in and out among the people and especially to preach the word under which word they're instructed and comforted. And if the people don't have preaching and the children don't have catechism and he can't go in and out because he's exhausted, the congregation's going to suffer too. It's not good for anyone. Now, if you're thinking along the lines of a husband or a wife or a father and mother, they're doing too much. They're trying to take it all on. You can easily see there too. You're not only going to suffer, but your family or the church will suffer too. Jethro has observed Moses. He's identified the problem. And now he's going to give some counsel or advice. Before I get to that, I want you to notice just a couple of things about Jethro and some lessons that we learned from him. He says, we'll get the fact before us first of all, in verse 19, Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Hearken now to me, son-in-law, I'm going to give you some counsel, and you should think of that as advice. And then he really expresses a desire or a wish that God would be with Moses should he implement this plan. We'll come back to that later at the end of the sermon. But notice, Jethro doesn't just see a problem, but he offers a solution. There are people, they've always been around, but around today, and they have some criticism, some complaint, maybe it's of an office bear or some aspect of how things go in the church. They have a complaint, they criticize, they've got problems, but if you say to that person, well, what plan do you think we should implement to fix it? That person is all teeth. Well, I haven't thought of that. I don't have any plan or solution. Some people just like to complain, to criticize, to take shots like that. We can learn a lesson from Jethro, can't we? All of us, myself included. There's a place for being critical, but it always has to be constructive. Here's the thing wrong as I see it, but here's how we can address it. That's what Jethro does. And then notice this too his wisdom and his humility that God had given to him, he doesn't demand Moses to do it. Son-in-law, what are you doing? Here's what you have to do. There's no other choice. Just do it. He doesn't do that. Jethro doesn't. He doesn't, you might say, shove it down Moses' throat. In fact, if you drop down in the text to verse 23, Jethro says, if thou shalt do this thing and God command thee so. He doesn't even assume that Moses is actually going to adopt his advice and he certainly doesn't assume that God has commanded it. Perhaps he has, perhaps he hasn't. He's simply giving advice. And we learn there too, people of God, that when we, are, when we see that we must be critical of someone else, and when we do give a solution, a plan for how they might be able to fix it, maybe that's an office bearer that it's directed toward, it's not only the advice itself that we give, but the way in which we go about it that is so important. It's never wisdom or humility to go up to someone and shove something down their throat and say, you've got to do this. What are you doing? but simply to offer it, as Jethro does, as advice. That's wisdom. That's humility. So what is that counsel that he gave to Moses? You might break it up into a couple of parts. You might say part one of the advice is verses 19 and 20. And this has to do with Moses himself and his work. Middle of 19, 
be thou, Jethro says to Moses, be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Right at the beginning there, literally it's, you, Moses, are for the people before God, that you may bring the matters to God. And he seems to mean there that Moses is in a unique position, God's representative, and so when the people come with their cases, he will then bring those cases to God, seeking his judgment of the matter. Now this is Moses' responsibilities according to phase or part one of the advice. Verse 20, he would be responsible for judgment yet, he would still be hearing cases, but here's the difference, and it comes on later in the verses. Moses will be taking only the more difficult cases, and not all of them. The less difficult, less significant ones will be for the others, but he'll take the harder ones. So already, there is some alleviating for Moses as to the workload. But also, and notice what keeps on do, he doing, he will still teach. So when these difficult cases do come to him, and maybe in other aspects as well, he'll teach the people God's statutes and laws, make them to know how they are to work, how they are to live, and what they are to do as a thankful people for a God who has redeemed them from the land of Egypt. He has to have time to teach. And that time is made when he only takes the more difficult cases. That's part one. Moses, still judge, take the more harder cases, and teach, teach, teach. Now, part two of Jethro's advice, this has to do with the people who will help Moses in his work. This is verses 21 and 22. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So, Moses needs to, according to part two of the plan, select or provide men from the people, and those men that he selects or provides, those will be the ones now that are over the people as rulers. Rulers, Jethro says, over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. Now we won't get into all the details there, but there's a certain organizational structure. You understand that you'd have one man over a certain amount of people and a, another man over another certain amount. It seems to me that there's an appeal system here. So let's say you and another man are having a dispute, and so you go to the ruler over 10, and you're not satisfied with his judgment. Then you'll go to the ruler over 50, and if you still want to appeal to the ruler over 100, and then yet you still want to keep on going to the ruler over 1,000. So it appears that there was some sort of appeal system. But nice, neat, organized system that's set up. These people are called rulers, Jethro calls them. They also will be responsible for judging the case people, deciding the cases. But like I said earlier, They'll take only the lesser cases. Moses will be taking the greater ones, so that especially Moses has time to teach the people the law of God. Now about these men, they have to be qualified. And there's that string of words in verse 21. Whoever, whomever Moses selects to put above the people as rulers have to be able men, gifted, skilled for the office that they were to occupy. They must be 
fearers of God. Fearers of God. Standing in awe before His face. Knowing Him to be the great God and the God of their salvation. But especially they have to be fearers of God because they're going to have the faces of men right in front of them all the time. And they cannot please men, seek to do that, and they not, may not be afraid of men. They have to stand before the face of God only. They have to be God-fearers. They must also, these men that Moses appoints over the people, be men of truth. Now that doesn't mean so much that they never lie, but they always speak the truth. That's of course included. But it has to do with their character. Dependable, faithful, reliable men. Also, haters of covetousness. It's interesting that the word in the original actually comes at its root from a word that means tearing, ripping. And that's probably where we get our idea, ripping people off. There's a lust for gain in a man. And what comes out of that is he gyps people. He rips them off. He's dishonest. And sometimes he even uses violence to get gain. And especially a man who might even use his very office so that he can get more and more. Men who are to be these rulers must hate that covetousness. Deuteronomy chapter 1 adds three more things here. They must be men of wisdom and understanding and also those who are known. You can't have someone that's just not very well known among the tribes of Israel and say, well, this guy is going to be a ruler now. You people don't even know him. You don't even know if he's qualified. He must be known among the tribes. That's Jethro's advice in parts 1 and 2. Should Moses implement this counsel, this will be the result. Verse 23 and verse 24 If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then shalt thou be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. Actually, the end of verse 22 as well. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If you do this, Moses, your burden is going to be lightened. Rulers will carry the work with you, and you'll be able, my son-in-law, to endure. You won't wear away. And the people will go to their place in peace. Their cases will have been decided and resolved. As far as Jethro's advice is concerned, I want to take that and apply that to the church today. Now, we have to be a little bit careful because this is the Old Testament and we live in the New Testament and there are some differences, so we can't take every single detail and press it into the application, but just take the broad lines of thought and the principles and apply them. And how this applies to the church today, beloved, is that there is to be a plurality of men in the office. When I say plurality, I just mean a body of men, a number of them. Moses, you must not be doing this alone. You need these other people to come alongside you. And there's a principle for the New Testament church. And that's why in this congregation, we have a consistory which is a body of men. Five to be exact. We don't have just one Man, And we get that from a text like this. And the application is also this. There must be a plurality of men who are qualified. When it comes to the whole office bearer process in our church, we ought to be thinking among the other qualifications of Scripture, also of these. Is a man also in today's church able? And is he a fear of God? And when he goes in and out among the congregation and goes to family visitation 
and maybe labors with someone or some people, is he going to be afraid of their faces? And is he going to try to want to please them? Or is he going to be a man who stands before God's face and that's the only thing that matters? We want men, people of God, who are also men of truth. They're faithful, they're reliable and dependable. Men who hate covetousness and we're confident that they never use their office in order to gain and they're not dishonest in their business practices at work. We want wise and understanding men and those who are known. Not just anyone that walks through the door, maybe becomes a member and has been here for a month. We don't know that person. Someone that's new, we don't know them. A man who's known in the church. The application for today, plurality of men who are qualified and this, that among that plurality of qualified men, there is a certain distribution of the work of caring for the church. And now you understand we really get to the heart of things as far as the application goes from this text. Moses had things that he was responsible for, but then these other rulers had work that they were called to do, and so also in the church today. Deacons, collect and distribute the alms and care for the poor. That's their responsibility. Ruling elders, the men who during the worship service sit in the pew and listen to the sermon and go about other work, but we call them ruling elders because that's exactly primarily what they're responsible for. All the aspects of rule in the church and governing. But then you have the teaching elder. And remember, did you hear even how our form tonight distinguishes these? Teaching elder is the pastor. And he's called teaching because he preaches and he's primarily responsible for the teaching of the people of God in catechism and in many other ways. Among this plurality of men, therefore, you have a certain distribution of the work and one of the goals of that is so that each man can give full justice to the work that God called them to, especially the minister. He's got to be able to preach and to devote his time rigorously to that during the week. He's got to be able to do that. And having these other men in the threefold office provides the space that he needs and the time to preach and teach. There's something wonderful here. Christ, the one who is greater than Moses and of whom Moses is a type, has sat in our church men through whom He shows just how much He cares for you and loves you. Isn't that wonderful? Christ is so good to us. That's what we have to walk away from at an installation service like this. And these men are gifts to us. Are you thankful for them? And then don't ever forget to look beyond these men because they're just instruments to the judge, the ruler, the office bearer, the righteous one, Jesus Christ, in whose hand these office bearers are, who never wears away, who cares for our church, who carries our burdens, who teaches us, loves us. That's what we ought to remember. And when the church is so structured as Jethro advised, the result will be also for today that no one office bearer has too heavy a burden. They all carry it together. And any one office bearer, the minister or someone else, can endure. And the congregation goes home in peace. Moses, 
followed it. He carried out that plan that Jethro gave. We read of that in verse 24. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Isn't that striking too? Don't you learn something from that? Moses didn't bristle under his father-in-law's advice. But he humbly implemented it and he understood this to be good counsel and to be God's will revealed through his father-in-law and he knew that this would be truly good for the people and for the glory of God. So he didn't say, well, I don't know about that. I've been doing it this way and I think that's just fine. His pride didn't get in the way. Moses got out of the way so that his people could be fed and God glorified. And I say that we learn something there because sometimes an older, wiser man in the church may come to an office bearer and he has some advice. And then that office bearer must not bristle under that and, and let his pride get in the way. And I don't know about that. I, I'll have to think about that. I probably won't do it. It's easy to bristle under a little bit of criticism. But that applies to, just to our life in the church, isn't it? When someone offers you advice and they find some problem, perhaps, in your life, easy to try to buck that and to be a little bit sour about that. We learn from Moses, he humbly received it. And so must we today. Is it in harmony with this? Will it truly be good for the congregation? Well, then why do I even think a second thought? I'll do what that person has brought to me. So Moses does it. That's verses 25 and 26, his implementation of Jethro's advice. I won't reread those because it's basically the same thing that he was counseled to do. I will just say that if you read Deuteronomy chapter 1, it seems to mean there that Moses chose these rulers in the sense that he began a process whereby the people themselves actually chose the men. And then once the people themselves chose the men, then Moses actually put them in their position as rulers. I say that's interesting because there was the involvement not only of Moses, but also of the people themselves. And once he did that, then they went about their work just as Jethro had said. And by application, we're not starting to adopt Jethro's advice in our church today. But what we have here is an encouragement, keep on going, and even to progress in this. God was with Moses. You remember that little tidbit I said we'd come back to? When Jethro says to his son-in-law, verse 19, I will give thee counsel and God shall be with thee. He's expressing a desire or wish that God would be with him in carrying out this plan. And God was with these men, endowing them with grace and strength and wisdom to carry out this advice. Current office bearers and newly installed men, God will be with you too. In and for the sake of that greater than Moses, Jesus Christ. He lives in you by His Spirit and He will supply you with the grace, the strength, the wisdom for your task. Rely on Him and don't look at yourself, but to Him who is the great office bearer, judge, ruler, head, and teacher of His church. Amen. Father in Heaven, replenish these men with Thy grace richly. Go with them. And Father, bless the structure of church government that we have may it be good for the office bearers and for thy people and to thy glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.